Now, we started a little series last week on Be Not Deceived. We're going to continue on with that today. Is that all right? Yes. I said, is that all right? Yes. Is that all right? Yes. If you don't amen me loud, I'll just keep asking, is it all right? Yes. All right. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> um, in Matthew chapter 24, and we'll review just a little, not much, but a little, and it'll move us forward. But in Matthew 24, um, on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came unto him and asked him certain things about what would be coming in the last days. And he began to give them an answer, and that Matthew 24 deals with a lot of those things, and we won't go into a study on that chapter. But the first thing he said in verse number four in response to the, what they made inquiry of, he said, uh, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So the very first thing that Jesus told us that would be a sign or something to be at least warned about or cautious of is that there would be deception in those last days. Now, I really believe that we're in those last days. I, I said this last week. I don't want to spend too much time on it. That information is given. It's available to you if you want it. Um, but that Matthew 24 is not necessarily a prophetic declaration for the church. That is a time that's declared in the tribulation period. That's important to know that because so many people read those verses. And I've had people ask me even on, uh, on uh, programs I've been on, they've asked me, said, well, uh, where are we in this time schedule that we see these things unfolding? I said, we're not in it at all. Uh, it's not happened yet. But it will. Everybody say it will. Yeah. But if we're not in it yet, we still see it unfolding, so that way we know for sure we're in the foreshadow of it, and we know it's close. Because we already see some of those things happening, but what Jesus prophesied specifically is coming. It's not presently in the time of its fulfillment. Amen. But he did say that one of the signs of the times would be uh, deception. And so that's why we're talking about be not deceived. Well, if he said be not deceived, then there's evidently some responsibility that falls on us to not let it happen. Amen. And so we can prevent it but we kind of need to know how. Well, one of the big ways you know how is to know it's a potential problem. you got to be informed that it's possible. Amen? Amen. Say it's possible, it's possible for, deception to come. for deception to come. But I'm not receiving it. Not receiving. In, Jesus name. In Jesus' name. Now, to say you're not receiving it, however, is not quite enough. There's a little bit more to it than that. Amen? So we're talking about these things for the purpose of giving you some, um, well, some bullets for your gun, you know, <laughs> to put some arrows in your quiver, give you some weaponry to work with. And then he said in verse 11, same chapter, he said, for many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. Now notice this deception comes in many cases through men or men doing the deceiving. Now, devil, the devil is the author of deception. He's the one that is behind it. But he uses people. Now, that's not all he uses. He'll use circumstance, events, and various things. But he does use people. That's one of his big tools. Amen? Amen. Say, the devil uses people. Amen. And he goes on in verse 24. He said, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and show, shall, shall show great signs and wonders in so much if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So here we have again this declaration of deception that's a potential for the time that's coming and I think that we're living in, even though I've made a, a difference between Matthew 24 and the present day, it's still a time that we're living in. There's a great deception. We find in Ephesians 4 and verse number 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine 
by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now there's a lot in that verse. Uh, children, that means growing up. Now when it talks about growing up, it's talking about spiritually growing up. Uh, you can remain a child forever. I mean, you can be saved for 50 years and still be a child in your understanding. He said, for this time you ought to be teachers, but you have a need that one teach you again. Now, that's an indictment on the church. When you need to be taught again, things you ought to be teaching others. It's time to wake out of slumber. It's time to wake into righteousness. We can't remain children forever. We have to grow up. Everybody say grow up. And so it says that if, if we're children, then we're tossed to and fro. So that gives us an uncertainty of life. There's this ebb and flow of life. There's, there's all kinds of things that push and shove on you. But if you're always tossed to and fro, there's something wrong with you. If you're always shook up about something, what's your testimony? What does that say about you? At what point in time do you stand? Or is it somebody else's responsibility to stand for you? Now we pray for one another, and we should, and it's good to, and we need that. But there's times you just have to stand. When you've done all to stand, stand there for. You got to stand. Amen? Everybody has to take a stand. And he said, this wind of doctrine that blows through. I mean, there's so many things over the times that we've been here that you see blow through. There's this new this and new that. And what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? It just blows through and blows through and blows in, blows out and blows up. You know, and a lot of people are caught up in it and they don't even know what to think because they're just, they're just caught up. What do you think about this, Pastor? What do you think about that? What about this new thing that's blowing in? Well, just stay with the word and you'll be all right. Well, are you, are, you, are you into this new move? Well, I'm into the, you know, if it's the Holy Spirit, yeah, I'm into it. We're not against anything new as long as it's new in God and consistent with Scripture. God wants to do a new thing, let Him do it. If He wants to have a new move, let Him have it. I'm in. I'm all in. But we're not having any new moves outside the word of God. Amen. 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 Jesus said to you do err, not knowing the scripture. Now listen to this part though, nor the power of God. You know what that word power out there is? That's the Greek word dunamis. When Jesus said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. He said that in in a number of places, in Acts 1, other places. But, but we know that if you get off the Word, you do err not knowing the Scripture. But people can actually know the Word with the wrong spirit. I mean, they can quote verses to you, but it's got the wrong spirit in it. See, you need to have powers of discernment about you. You need to be able to pick out things. You need to be able to see things. You just need to. And so we get into error when we don't know the Word and we don't know the leadings of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the Holy Spirit shall show you things to come. He reveals things to you if you let Him. Now, this, well, I feel this, and I think God wants this. And that's not good enough. All your feelings and all have to come under the heading of what does the scripture say? Well, I had a dream. Well, that's good. There's a song about that, wasn't there? I had a dream last night, you know, or something like, you know? Well, we, you can have dreams, and we do, and, and there's some scripture in that for that. And you can, you can establish dreams as being biblical. If they're biblical, just because you had a dream doesn't make it scriptural. You get what I'm talking about? So you can't be led by dreams. You pay attention, but you got to know the word. You have to judge a dream by the Bible. <laughs> you know, isn't that amazing? I said, isn't that amazing? 
Yeah. So he said, uh, the winds of doctrine blow through, through, the slight of men, the cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So the devil uses all these things because he's a deceiver and he lies in wait to deceive. So he wants to deceive people. His big tool is stealth. He wants to hide out. He wants to hide in the shadows. He wants to tell you he's not doing it. He wants to tell you he doesn't exist. He wants to tell you it's not him. He doesn't want you to know what he's up to. But Paul said we're not ignorant of his devices. We know the wiles, tricks of the devil. So we got to know what he does. So Satan has many forms and types of deception. Now today I want to take a little dive, and this won't be a... a there, there's nothing that we're going to say that's exhaustive. No matter what you say, there's more to say. But sometimes you just introduce the concept. And we may go a little further with it, we may not. But the point is, is you need to be aware of some of the concepts and some of the things he does use. Amen. So we're going to talk to you today about religious deception. Religion, and we all probably have some of it. We... uh, Some people have a a car religion. They're very religious about their love for automobiles. Some people love draperies or whatever it is that makes your house look the way it's supposed to look, ladies. So we get almost religious, a religious fervor about it. But I'm not talking about those kind of religions. I'm talking about spiritual religion that connects us or seems to connect us to God. Now, religion is really how you act out your faith. That's what it is. It's what do you do with what you say you believe. It's your actions. It's your activities. How do we worship? Or what is worship? You know, you think about worship. Well, we go to church and we have a worship service. Well, that's good. But what is worship? And there's lots of, lots of different people hung a lot of different definitions on that. But let me tell you what worship is in its simplest form. You ready? It's loving God back. He who first loved us, we love him in return. That's what worship is. And it can take on any numbers of forms. Lifted hands, bowed knee. Speaking praise out of your heart to the Lord. Speaking thanks out of your heart to the Lord. Singing in church. A lot of the songs that are done in church are not worship. I'm not talking, I'm not saying that criticizing. I'm just saying some of them are entertainment. And some of them don't don't really love God at all. They just talk to one another. I love you. You love me. Let's love one another. That's all okay. We're supposed to. I mean, Scripture tells us to. But really, worship is simply loving God back. He who first loved us, we return love to Him. And if we do that in our singing, then praise God. But there's more than one way to do that. But they all got to be measured by Scripture. Well, I worship God in my own way. Well, your own way has to come under the parameters that you find in Scripture. We worship God in spirit and in truth. You know what truth is? My word is truth. So you worship God according to the truth, the patterns that He gives you. But He gives you a lot of patterns for it. And you can worship God quietly at home in your lazy boy. You can. I know, I do. Amen. So you don't have to go to church to worship God. You can worship God driving down the road. Just keep your eyes on the road and your hands on the wheel. But, uh, you know, you can. See, you don't, you don't have, that's the beauty of it. You can just worship God anywhere. But now religion, see that, that is an out, that is an expression of your religion. That is an expression of you serving God in a way that is inspired by your love for him. Amen? Amen. However, religion, when it's mentioned in Scripture, there's only one place I know of in Scripture where it speaks of religion positively. 
And you go over here in James chapter 1, and this kind of defines what I'm saying. But in verse uh, 21, James 1, 21, it says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul, and be ye doers of the word. Well, now that is religion in practice. Be ye doers of the word. You're practicing your religion. Amen. That's a proper practice of religion. Be a doer of the work. What you do related to what you believe. Be do doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Deceiving your own selves. Now we're talking about religious deception. Or deception by religion. Amen. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. So in other words, uh, if you do what you do, if you read what you read and don't do what you read, then you're not consistent between what you say you believe and how your actions are. See, your religion is not working right. We'll read that on down here. For he beholdeth himself... And goeth his way, and straightway forget what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, and be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. So that is the practice of religion right there expressed, right there in that passage. You do what you say you believe. You're consistent. You're not in conflict with your heart or with the word. Amen? It's all together. But then he goes on to say, if any man among you seem to be religious... There's the word. And bridleth not his tongue. Hmm. Get that little animal under your nose under control. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And bridleth not his tongue, but see, deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. So religion can be practiced in a vain way. Now vain means basically unprofitable. That's, that's really what it means mostly. So uh, there's a way that religion can be practiced, but it's no good. Did you hear me? So we can practice religion and it be no good. So not all practice of religion is good. And you see in here that if it's not according to word, if it's not true to your heart, if it's not true to the God who... We're worshiping, then that religion is in vain. Amen? Amen? Now, I'm here to submit to you there's a lot of religion going on that's vain religion in a lot of places. Now, I'm not here to judge or throw darts or, you know, throw mud or cast shade. I'm just here to tell you if you just look around, there's a whole lot of religion being practiced that's not consistent with what we just read right there. He said, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their, situ in their affliction and keep himself unspotted from the world. Now that's what he said a true practice of religion is. And that's the only place in, in Scripture that I can find where religion is really mentioned positively. So religion is not one of those biblical concepts that God's got a lot of good things to say about it. Not a lot of good things to say. And you'll see that as we unfold. So there's a true religion, there's a true practice of religion, but there's also a phony or a false practice of religion. Amen? Amen? Amen. Religion that is not scriptural is vain. I read that. Were you here when I read that? Okay, I'm just saying. Now, there's a, this, this is illustrated a number of times in scripture. And uh, let's go over here to uh, John chapter three. And this is a story you're probably familiar with, but now religion has the ability to make us think we're okay when we're not. Religion is this practice that's supposed to take us closer to God, but doesn't necessarily do it. Religion is sometimes rule keeping. Now, when I say rule keeping, those rules are kept often by people who don't know, listen, the rule giver. 
If you don't know the rule giver, because he does give us, give us rules. You remember the Ten Commandments? There are certain rules to live by. Now, what the pagans do is they try to keep rules to please a deity that they don't know even what he wants. And that's man-made rules, religious, but even pagan. We sacrifice the virgin to the volcano. Go to Hawaii and listen to the history of the country. It's a part of the religion that they came from. And you go to other parts of the world and they have certain ritualistic things that are so far from biblical that it's not even funny, but they are religious practices. So religion is an attempt in those cases to please a God that you don't even know what he wants. So you have to make it up. And so therefore, religions are set in motion and they're set in place and a lot of heavy-handed rule giving that binds people to certain things and rituals and ritualistic maneuvers that have nothing to do with Scripture whatsoever. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I believe going to the movies is a sin. Oh, just show me the verse. Well, I'll tell you what, you'd be better off as a Christian if you didn't go to the movies. Now, I probably agree with that part. But it's not a sin unless you go to the wrong movies. <laughs> but you see, we do it in Christian circles as well as the pagan circles. We set up a set of rules that we think, and it's really the rules we make up. Well, I'll tell you one thing right now. I don't believe women ought to wear makeup. Oh, really? It's like one guy said, any old barn looks better with a coat of paint. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm not calling any names. I'm just saying. Just talk. <laughs> you get what I mean? <laughs> but you see, we make a set of rules that we think God's pleased with, and they don't really have much to do with Scripture. Now, there may have been somebody who got closer to God because of not wearing makeup. And I'm not ridiculing anybody. I'm just talking how we get where we get to. And then we got this, we got this set of beliefs that we don't even know necessarily where they came from. But we practice it because it's our religion. I had a friend good person, a good man, really good man. But I worked with him. And um, <laughs> anyway, we were talking about the spirit-filled life in the way that we talk about it. And he's a good man. Okay? Well, I can't say much. I was too. So any stone I throw, I got to throw it myself here. So we're not criticizing. We're just talking. Okay. Is it okay to talk? You know, it's points we understand. But he said, I'll tell you what. He, he said, now, you know, and they were practicing the gifts in church and things like that. And it was a church that we were referring to where the people got spirit filled as did the pastor. And you know what his take on it was? He said, I don't mind them doing it. He said, I just mind them doing it in a church. That's true. I mean, exactly what he told me. He said, he said, because it's deceptive. I said, well, somebody maybe ought to change something. So it's not wrong to do it. It's just wrong to do it there. Now, see, that's religion. A hundred percent religion. Because biblically you can do it. You just can't do it in that house. Now he's a good man and I love him. And we, you know, of course, you know me, I ain't going to be quiet. 
you know. But, you know, that's how people think. So here we find that religion has the ability to make us think we're okay when we're not. And it can be a substitute for faith in God. Religion can substitute for faith in God. We find in uh, John 3, verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So he was religious. He's a ruler of the Jews. Now, I will say this. I, I won't have time to cover it today, but I will say this. Later, we find Nicodemus, after Jesus was crucified, being a part of, of the recovery of the body. So Jesus, Nicodemus did come to faith. Okay, so we don't, we certainly don't speak ill of him. But at this point in time in his life, he's exploring. He's making discoveries. And uh, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus said, answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now here's a religious man that came to Jesus and acknowledged what Jesus did. And he said, I'm telling you, your religion is not going to cover you. Except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And he asked him questions. How's that going to be? Do I enter the second time into my mother's womb? And he said, no, you don't understand. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. So he was talking about a spiritual rebirth. And he said, the reason that people don't go to heaven is not because they're not religious. He said, the reason that people don't go to heaven is because they're not born again. <clears throat> and I don't care how religious you are. I don't care how much religion you have. I don't care how much you try to keep the rules. I don't care how many churches you belong to. I don't care. In the end, it's not going to matter. When Jesus comes back, he's not looking for a denominational tag over your doorpost. He's looking for blood, and that's what he sees, and that's all he wants. And there's a covenant that we make with the Almighty God through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you're not born again, you don't go. And I mean, there's no, I don't care how religious you are. Well, I believe that a man, if a man's good works that way is bad, then he goes. Well, you're mistaken. You can be a good person, and without the new birth, you don't go. You can be religious, you can tithe, you can do everything you want to do. You can be re I'm talking about the deception of religion. Be not deceived. And there's a lot of people deceived by this. There are people who really, I mean, I'm talking about Christian denominations that really believe and will say publicly that they believe when you come to the end that your good works outweigh your bad and therefore you get to enter in. It's, I don't care how good and how mountainous your good works are. It's not good enough. It is by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You are not saved by good works. You are saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Period. That's it. That's it. And I'm talking about, guys, I'm telling you, I just, I, I, just, I just hear stuff. I hear stuff. I hear people say things. It's like, I just, you, don't, don't, you don't know the Bible at all. And these are supposedly men and women of God that are leading people. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. <laughs> Amen. And so Jesus said, your religion, Nicodemus, is not going to be good enough. You have to be born again. Now, religion won't hurt you if it's true religion. So religion is not bad if it's true. Religion is bad when it's false. And as much, evidently, there's as much false or maybe more false than true. Because religion is kind of made up by men, usually. The rule givers, the rule keepers. We find in Matthew 27, verse 1, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders, everybody say chief priests and elders. Jesus. You know who that is? That's religious folk. Everybody say religious folk. Religious. Well, chief priest and an elder, that'd be religious. That's about as religious as you can get. The chief priests and elders of the people took counsel, listen, against Jesus. 
Hmm. So here we have the Savior, Jesus Christ. No man comes to the Father but by me, but religion take an issue with the Savior. Religion in exact opposition to the Savior. Folks, that was that day, but that is this day. There's many religious leaders that bend truth. And Jesus said, I am the truth. They bend truth. They make it up as they go. And they think because the religious that they're going to be okay. Religion won't get you there. And they persuade men. Remember, we're talking about avoiding deception. And religious deception is one of the greatest tools that the enemy uses. It's real. And they took counsel against the Lord Jesus to put him to death. And when they bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. And so here we find religious leaders are responsible for the very crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, the very Savior of the world, and it was religious leaders that crucified him. Now, the Romans had something to do with it, but they would have not done it had the religious leaders not forced the issue. You hear me? We find in verse 11, Matthew 27, and Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he had accused him, and when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. So the accusations against Jesus that led him to Calvary came from religious leaders. Oh, it doesn't matter what kind of lifestyle you live. You know, we've got a modified Bible now. Religious leaders. No, you don't have a modified Bible. You made a religiously modified Bible to fit you in what you wanted to do. But his word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you're still stuck with it. And I promise you at the end, that is exactly what you're going to be judged by, not your religious rules. They won't work for you. And we find in uh, verse 20, Matthew 27. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. So here we have religious leaders persuading the multitude. And so it's not just their own deception. It's a deception that they convey. It's a deception that they sell. It's, it's a thing that they want others to buy into. They have religious power because the mass trust what they say. And whole denominations are geared around those very things. And you can deny the very Savior who bought you and paid for you. As long as you get your way and you get the power, prestige, and all the things that comes with your religious garb. And it'll do you no good in the end. No good. We're living for eternity. We're not living for right now. Did you hear me? I said, did you hear me? Now, it's interesting. We find in, 20, in Matthew 27, 18, for he knew. Now, listen, this, this is a pilot here in this whole story. But in verse number 18, he said he knew that for envy they delivered him. And so religion envies a genuine move of God. And so for envy, they will sell their own soul to not lose their position. You have no power. We have power. You have no authority. You have no following. We have the following. And they will sell their own soul for the following or for the power or the money or the prestige or for the ability to make broad their phylacteries and pray long prayers in the marketplace and look pious and wear their robes or their business suit or their uh, cut out jeans and shirt tails out. It all changes depending on the crowd. Some places you look pious and some places you look cool, but it's still the same religious spirit. 
Are you home? Yes. Pretty good. Now you find this over here in Galatians chapter 4. And I'm going to begin to read from verse 16. We talked about this a little bit. But I'm going to explore it just a little bit. Now because we're putting it in the context of religion. And we're talking about the context of, of because of envy and things like that. And, and to hold their position of power. That's why sometimes religion will do that. There's lots, lots of reasons, but that's one of the big ones. Amen. We don't lose, want to lose our status. But we find, in, and I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Classic, because I don't have time to do both. In uh, verse number 16, For I then become your enemy by telling the truth to you and dealing sincerely with you. In other words, there are people that if you tell the truth... Now, folks, if you don't think that's the day we live in, you are kidding yourself. You can't tell the truth without it causing stir and making waves. The truth causes problems. You can't tell the truth on the news. They'll, they'll, they'll restrict you. You can't tell the, the truth on social media. They'll restrict you. They'll, they'll put you to the side if you tell the truth. They'll, they'll, uh, you know, you got to be woke enough, you know, they'll, they'll put you off. Amen. So you can be an enemy for telling the truth because people don't want the truth. You know why the scripture says they don't want the truth? Because their de deeds are evil. They don't want to be told the truth. Well, just tell the truth, pastor, and they'll come person who told you that would lie to you about something else. Everybody wants the truth as it relates to somebody else. Tell them the truth, pastor, but don't tell me the truth. Mm -hmm. I get it. And it says, these men, verse 17, these men, the Judaizing teachers, that's the religious folk. Wouldn't you agree? I said, wouldn't you agree? How are we doing? Okay. These men, the Judaizing teachers, are zealously trying to dazzle you, paying court to you, making much of you, but their purpose is not honorable or worthy or for any good. They want to do, uh, what they want to do is to isolate you from us who oppose them. What they dazzle you for or brag on you about is to isolate you from the one who was telling you the truth. They got to stop the person telling the truth because if the truth be known, their power structure is questionable. So they've got to undermine. Now, this is what we call in modern vernacular gaslighting. I got to make you guilty so nobody sees me. Mm -hmm. Adam was the original gaslighter. God, this woman you gave me. So it's all on you two. Man, that had nothing to do with it. This woman you gave me. She made me do it. Hmm. Well, we try it, don't we? But it doesn't work. Adam still got judged for it. Even though he tried to gaslight God and Eve. Hmm. Pretty, pretty good. Anyway, but it started a long time ago. And it says, uh, they make much of you. Their purpose is not honorable or worthy of any good for what they want to do is isolate you from us who oppose them so that they may win you over to their side and get you to court their favor. That's what religion does right there. Lies against the truth, make the truth look like it's false. I don't care if they do it. Just don't do it in a church. Why is it wrong because it's there or is it right? I'm not ridiculing, I'm just talking. You could put any, any label you want to on it. It just happened to be that one for that moment in time. Are you here? Yeah. I said, are you here? Yeah. 
It is always a fine thing, of course, to be zealously sought after, as you are provided, that is, for a good purpose, and done by reason of purity of heart and life, and not just when I am present with you. Listen, people who have to put somebody else down to elevate themselves, you better be careful of that person. You better be very, very careful of that person. My little children, for whom I am suffering birth pains until Christ is completely and permanently formed, molded within you. And so Paul said, I pray for you. I travail for you until Christ be formed in you. What he said is a person cannot stand up against that opposition until they're fully formed in Christ. The immature cannot stand it. The immature will yield. It's only mature people that are able to stand the flattery and see the truth. That's a better statement than you amended. I guarantee it was. But it's the way it works. It's the law of the jungle. I'm telling you how deception works. Religious deception. It has to push down. Oh, those. Are you one of those people that believes in the gifts of the Spirit? Yeah, I am. Well, we, we you know, I, I, I understand some people need that. Really? Yeah, like you. <laughs> the problem is, is forgive me, pray for me later. But the problem with you is, is you're just too dumb to know it. Or too prideful to admit it. But you have got to do away with women preachers. Because we might lose somebody to that train of thought. And we can't let that come in here because it might undermine some of the things that we do and then we'd lose our robe of righteousness. You might have already lost it. <laughs> True. Talking about religious deception. And what it does, and it will lie against the truth to keep their place of power. That is exactly what that says. Amen? I said amen. amen. And you have to pray for people that get caught in that. Because that's a powerful web. I'm talking about deception, guys. The devil doesn't want you to know he's doing it. He wants to tell you, they're the bad guys. They did it. Don't listen to them. They don't know what you're talking about. Just read it from the scripture. Let's just, let's just measure it right there. You want to have a debate? Open it up. I've had to tell people why, what verses they were trying to quote against me. I had to tell them where they were at. <laughs> oh, you mean? Well, the Bible says, where? Uh, 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 let me tell you. I've been there. I was there before you. So I know what I'm talking about. Well, all these things passed away. Show me. Just show me. Show me it passed away. Well, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Prophecies, they shall vanish or, you know, fade away. And all, all, these, and all these things, you know, they, 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 they fade away. When? Well, uh, 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 when that which is perfect has come. Oh, okay. What's perfect? Well, the Bible. Oh, really? Then why did it say face to face? Why did it say face to page? It doesn't cease till we see him face to face. And I hate to tell you this, that hadn't happened yet. So what you think you know, you don't. And what you think you're so piously holy uh, about, maybe you don't know what you're talking about. Maybe you just think you know what you're talking about. So pull out the book and we'll look. If you're right, I'll submit. But you've got to prove it to me. Don't gaslight me for believing something. Do you show me why I shouldn't? Religion. It is absolutely rampant everywhere. Everywhere. Are you home? Matthew 15, verse 1. Then came to Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples 
uh, transgress the traditions, traditions hmm, of the elders, for they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Well, that'll get you to heaven. I'm going to tell you, you wash those hands right and you'll go. <laughs> Why don't you get you a manicure? That'll help you. <laughs> you got to get those nails clean now. That'll get you to heaven quicker. Hmm. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also trance the commandments of God by your traditions? See, when tradition has more power in your life than the word of God, that's nothing but religious deception. And we get handed down to us our traditions, and they can come in a lot of forms. They can come from high church, or they can come from low church. And the low church has as many traditions as the high church. They're just different. Well, I'll tell you what I believe. Well, just pull the book out, and I'll tell you what I believe. You get what I'm talking about? And it happens, guys, and it's real. And uh, in verse 12, Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended <laughs> after they heard this saying? <laughs> you, you mean to tell me that Jesus offended a religious person? I can't even imagine it. That Jesus offended a religious person. Oh, oh, what are we going to do? I don't know. We've offended the religious crowd. Uh, like one fellow said, I've come to uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. So here we are. But he answered and said, Every plant which my Father, which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. <laughs> oh, let them alone. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. I've offended the religious people. Just leave them alone. Leave them. Leave them. Leave them alone. Why? They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. So when you have blind leaders, you've got a whole bunch of people in a ditch. I'm talking about religious deception. Things that ought not be said in the name of the Lord. Well, you know, we're, we're, we're those, we're progressive in our understanding of Scripture. We believe the Bible is a living book and it changes as we move through life. And what we used to believe, we now no longer believe because we've outgrown that. Well, when did you become God? When did you have the right to change? Did you ever read in the book of Revelation said, if you add to or take away from, your part will be taken out of the book of life. You play with it if you want to. I'm not playing with it. Well, that just means the book of Revelation. Well, I don't know what it means, but whatever it means, I'm not doing it. I'm not changing it. So just call me old-fashioned. Give me that old-time religion. <laughs> you know, if the King James Version was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. That didn't get as good a laugh as it should have right there. I guarantee you that. Maybe I need to qualify that one. But anyway, you know what I'm saying. Like, amen. We find over here in Revelation 13... Now, this is an interesting passage. This is the passage that gives us the revelation or the coming to place or power of the man of sin, the Antichrist. And actually, it calls him the beast. And then there, in addition to the beast, there's what we refer to as the false prophet. Well, we look down here in verse 11 of Revelation 13, and I beheld another beast. Now, this other beast is what we refer to as the false prophet, a religious leader. Everybody say religious leader. religious leader. We're talking about the deception of religion. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb. That's like Christianity. But he spake as a dragon. Looked like a Christian, spoke like a devil. Mm -hmm. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them that dwell Therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So this false 
prophet, false leader, false religious leader is responsible for getting the whole earth as much as will, getting the whole earth to worship the, the man of sin, a religious leader. A religious leader. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven the, on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them, deceiveth them, that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying unto them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. And... Uh, on and on and on, but you get the point. Here, this is the man that leads people. Now listen to verse 16. And he calls with all. This is the religious leader. Boy, I could say something right here. That if I did, I might clear the house. Yeah, bring it on. You ain't the one clearing the house. You don't, yeah, it's easy for you to say bring it on. You ain't the one that gets the rocks thrown, the prophet rocks thrown at you for it. But, um, and he calls with all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in their forehead. So it is the religious leader that leads people to take the mark of the beast. I shouldn't say this. What do you think of, no, I can't say it. No, I'm not saying it. Don't try to get me to say it. I rebuke it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just teasing you. Uh, but there's a lot of religious leaders during, I'll, just, I'll do this much. There's a lot of religious leaders did a lot of things to lead a whole bunch of people to take a whole bunch of things during the lockdown that they should have never led them to take. That's as generically and as nice as I can put it. I could have said it the other way. Well, I don't believe you should say that. Well, I don't care. <laughs> I did. <sighs> Karl Marx said, and I don't agree with much of what Karl Marx said or did, but he said this one thing. He said, religion is the opium of the people. Religion is a drug. You see that in manifestation in this passage of Scripture. See, religion will drug you to believe you're okay when you're not. It will drug you to believe you're right when you're wrong. It will drug you to believe that evil is good and good is evil. It will twist it around so a boy don't know he's a boy and a girl don't know they're a girl and a person thinks they're a cat. Well, we've got to give them freedom of expression. No, we need to send them to a psychiatric ward. what we need to do. Because that is crazy. Well, you're, you're not woke. I know it. And I'm not going to be woke. If you can't figure out from looking in the mirror what you are, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. So religion has a drugging effect on people. It calms people into submission. It's a drug. It calms them into submission. Religion, apart from Christ, is a drug that people think they're okay when they're not. Revelation 3, are you with me? Yes. How we doing? Yes. I got to hurry. Nor's given me the look. Revelation 3, 14. And the angel, you know, say the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. And uh, we kind of know that. This is the latter day church, end time church. It's really the church age that we're living in. There are two churches on the planet right now. The Philadelphia church, which is the rapture church. The Laodicean church, which is the left behind church. And they're both here running together right now. But he said to that lukewarm church, he said, you're neither cold nor hot. And because you're not cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And you say, uh, we're rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing. Now listen to this. 
And knowest not that thou art wretched, wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now the operative phrase right there is they didn't know it. They were lost and they didn't know it because of religion. They were in church. They had a group around them. They had a support group. I'm okay. You're okay. We're okay. We all believe this. God wouldn't let us all believe this if it were wrong. He'll let you do anything you want to. You have powers of choice. He'll let you do it. You don't have to. He said, be not deceived. So you have a choice. Mm -hmm. But they didn't even know that they were lost. That's what being spewed out of his mouth is, not worthy to make the rapture. Folks, the rapture and the resurrection are simultaneous events. That is the day the church closes. No more entries. These people do not get another chance to be in the church. This is it. You say, well, they may go to heaven. They may, but they won't go through and be the part of the church. The church is closed at the rapture. Door shut. Church age is over. And they didn't go. Because they didn't know religion had deceived them. Hmm. John 16, verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. <laughs> you shall put... They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time will come. Whosoever killeth you will think he doeth God a service. And that, that may you talk about bad guys. I mean, um, and these things they will do unto you because they've not known the Father or me. And so Jesus said that religion will kill you if they get a chance at you. To keep their way and to keep their power structure, they'll kill you who serve Christ if they can. Well, they'd kill you today if they could. Well, we don't stone today like they used to. Well, that doesn't mean that they still don't have the thoughts to. If you get in the way of their power structure, they, they don't have a place for you. Amen? Uh, we see uh, Stephen, and I won't go into it for time's sake, but Stephen stood before the Sanhedrin, the religious court of the day. And he made that discourse and he rehearsed the history of the nation of Israel. And he come on, in, he come on up and he said, you stiff-necked. And he, he said that to them. You stiff-necked and all that. And it says, and they were cut to the heart, verse 54. And it says that they ran on him and gnashed on him with their teeth. Now, I've had people mad at me. I never had anybody bite me. <laughs> they had that biting devil. <clears throat> You remember Dr. Summerall bitten by devils? You remember that? I won't go into that. That's another story. But anyway, and they, uh, it's, it's in verse 57. And they cried out with a loud voice. They bit on him and they cried out with a loud, loud voice and stopped their ears. They stuck their fingers in their ears and ran upon him with one accord and they cast him out and stoned him. Now, I'm going to tell you right there, that's what religion will do. When you confront religion with the truth. All he did was tell them the truth. Am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? In this case, he was. They, 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 they bit him. They stoned him. They killed him. And he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what to do. Just what Jesus did on the cross. Pretty commendable, isn't it? He forgave. And so uh, religion, I'm talking about religious deception. Amen. We find in 1 Corinthians 12 and 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. Isn't it amazing the things God tells us not to be ignorant of, we're the most ignorant of? That's why he puts it in there. Because he knows you're going to be ignorant of this unless you get some help. Unless you heed the warning. You know that you were Gentiles carried away under these dumb idols. Carried away under dumb idols. Idols that can't speak. That's an idol. Even as you were led. Religious Leaders led them after dumb idols. And notice it's in relationship to the gifts of the Spirit. The devil would rather have you worship a dumb idol than be filled with the Spirit. I'll guarantee you that. 
Amen. I'm hurrying. Give me a break. Everybody say, give him a break. Give the boy a break. Amen. Now, this is really important right here. And Jesus said, you know, you Pharisees, you blind Pharisees, you, you, you clean outside the cup and the platter, but inside it's filthy. He said, you got to be born again. You, gotta, you, you can do all the religious stuff, but you got to get that inside cleaned up. That's what he said. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, very, very, very important truth right here to remember. He said, we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and to admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourself. God says, you need to know who your leaders are. A monetized social media prophet is not a leader. Balaam got in trouble for that. We sell prophecies for money. We want you to check and subscribe, and we want you to, you know, make us feel big and good. We'll give you the prophecy of the moment. We'll give you a new word tomorrow. We'll give you a new word day after tomorrow. We'll tell you all about how the election is going to end up. We'll tell you all the things that are going on in the news and before the news. What's happening at the border, we'll tell it all to you. And we'll get you hooked and we'll get you addicted to our lies. Very few of a lot of these things that you hear through social media, very few are true. Very few. I don't listen to it. You better give me somebody I know and I trust. And you better let it come through the mouth of somebody that I have confidence in. I'm not taking it from somebody that this is their first crack at a prophecy. Well, you, you, you may hear God. You may hear something else too. Know them that labor among you. If they got 50 years of history and, and prophetic insight and revelation, you might want to listen to him. God, I, I, I have an agreement with God. If you're going to prophesy a word to me, you better bring it through somebody I trust. Because I don't receive them any other way. It doesn't come from the back row forward. Not that I'm too good to hear. I'm just too smart. I've been around this block a time or two. Thus saith the Lord. Well, okay. But God, I'm just telling you, you better send it by somebody who I know and trust. Because I'm not taking it otherwise. Well, you might miss out. Well, then I just miss out. Because he's still got an option to get somebody else to tell me. But that's just an agreement that we have. It's a, it's a working agreement. If you're going to prophesy to me, do it with somebody I know and trust. We were together, uh, John and Debbie and Nora, we were together. And one of the foremost prophets in the land had a word. And we heard him. We heard him give it. Well, I'm listening to that one. I'll be listening to that one. But, you know, back row parking lot profits. As you stand over the bumper of your car in the snow, would you hurry? It's cold. <laughs> you know, and I'm not saying people can't give you words and don't hear from God. I'm not saying that. But if the prophet gives a prophet, let, let the others judge. And if a person can't give you a prophecy that's judgeable, you don't receive it. Well, God showed me you should marry so-and-so. Well, he didn't show me, so you marry him. <laughs> it's the truth. I mean, you live a long time, you see a whole lot. I'm telling you the truth. It's like, I'll tell you what's worse than somebody giving a prophecy like that. I'll tell you what's worse is somebody listening to a prophecy like that. I thought you were smarter than that. <laughs> Amen. And so uh, you kind of get the point. Uh, I could go on here for a while, but I won't. But he said, if anybody preached to you any other gospel, let him be accursed. Know them that labor among you. I'm talking about religious deception, guys, and it's going on everywhere at every level. And I don't care what a denomination does with alternate lifestyles. I don't care the choices they make. You have to judge this according to Scripture. 
You have to believe it or disbelieve it. You have to accept it or reject it by what thus saith the word. You are in a sense, now you, you, you have protection of, of like-minded believers. You know these people. I mean, you know, and we trust one another. But truthfully, in a very real sense, you're on your own. You're not fully, but you are. You have to know how to navigate this life. I said to somebody not, not very long ago, and they're, you know, they're a great Christian. I mean, they really are. And I said, because we talk a lot now, I said, what would you do if I wasn't here? Well, what the answer is, is I'm going to go on. Because what you have right now as a support group is not going to be there forever. I don't care how good it is and how strong it is. You've got to be able to do this on your own. And the only way you can do it is with that book. That's the only way you can do it. Now, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I've made my attempt to preach what you gave me to preach, and I've gone a little long, which is typical. But, Lord, it's so important that this stuff that we're talking about be really heard, not just another sermon, but a revelation in the hearts and the minds of all of us. That Lord, Lord, there are workers out there seeking to overthrow, destroy, undermine, and, 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 and deceive at so many levels. And Lord, we ask you to protect us and help us to not fall prey to it. Now, we don't have to be afraid of it. You, told, you gave us tools to overcome it, but we've got to use our tools. And I pray, I bind that spirit of deception that would want to settle in on any person listening to my voice right now. I bind your power, and I pray that people can see through it. And Lord, we thank you for that. Now, if you're listening to me while your heads are bowed and you're respecting the moment, if you don't know Jesus Christ, that's your number one shield against these deceptive voices. You need to know him above anything else. If you're here in the room and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, or if you're walking at a distance from him, I want you to just lift your, lift your hand because we want to pray for you. We want that to change today. You need to change it today. If you're listening to me online and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you got a, you got a hand right there in your heart. You may not be in a place where you can lift your hand. There may be, you, the, the conditions may not be conducive to it. But that hand in your heart, lift it up before the Lord because He sees it. He really does. And he knows. So either here in the room, and I saw hands in the room go up, and we believe that God will do in you just what we said. But those of you listening online, we believe that you're as much a part of this service as those right here in the room. Let's pray this prayer together. Say, Jesus, I take you right now as my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you to serve you today and forever. I repent of my sins. Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. Now, if you prayed that prayer, know you meant it or you would never pray a prayer like that and not mean it. So let's just all lift our hands to heaven and thank him that he hears us when we pray. Lord, we give you the praise and glory for it. We make our profession of faith in Jesus' name. Jesus, we declare you are our Lord. You are my Lord. We make that declaration right now. Say that out. Say, Jesus, Jesus. you are my Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Now here in the room, and if you're in a place where you can there online, turn to somebody around you and tell them what you've done. Just here in the room, let's all stand a minute. Everybody turn to at least three people. Just tell them real boldly that Jesus Christ is your Lord. Would you do that?